We just watched a magnet float above a superconductor at a height of about two and a half millimeters. And that leaves me with a couple of questions. The first question is what is the magnetic dipole moment of that magnet? And a follow-up question to that is what current is induced in the superconductor in order to levitate the magnet? In order to answer these questions, let's make a cartoon drawing of what we just observed. The magnet is levitating above the superconductor, and there's the air interface with the superconductor shown with the horizontal dark line. So beneath that dark line, it's a superconductor. The magnet has a magnetic dipole moment given by m, and it is a vector in the z direction, which is the direction we will call vertical. The meissner oxenfeld effect describes how magnetic field is excluded from the interior of the superconductor. It's magnetic diamagnetism as opposed to atomic diamagnetism. It's a macroscopic property of the material supported by screening currents induced in the superconductor by the external magnet. Normal conductors don't do this. Metals don't have these screening currents in them which attempt to remove all magnetic field inside. This is specifically a property of superconductors. In the specific case of a magnet in the proximity of a superconductor, there's an image of the magnet inside the superconductor. So it's like a mirror, and these screening currents make it all possible. The magnetic dipole moment of this image magnet is in the opposite direction, but otherwise the same. And that's the only difference between the actual magnet and the image magnet is the direction of the magnetic dipole moment. At the surface of the superconductor, the magnetic fields of the real magnet and the image magnet are in perfect cancellation of each other. I really didn't think this demo would work with the magnet floating above a thin film of superconductor. The reason why is the structure of the superconducting sample is just a 400 nanometer thick film of superconducting material, thallium, barium, calcium, copper oxide, on a dielectric lanthanum aluminate substrate. The lanthanum aluminate is not superconductor. And the magnet is supported above that. And the field of the magnet has to be screened out of the interior of the superconductor by the screening currents which are induced in the superconductor. And that's a very thin area, which means that the currents are very concentrated and the current density is very high. And my concern was that the current density in the superconductor would exceed the critical current density, which is the maximum amps per square centimeter of current that a superconductor can carry and remain superconducting. Let's check this out with a calculation. And in order to do a calculation, we need to define a few terms. First, there's the mass of the magnet, capital M, as opposed to the magnetic dipole moment, lowercase m. The flotation height is z, which we measured to be about 2.5 millimeters. And the x-axis then will be the horizontal axis, so this black line follows the x-axis. And t is the thickness of the superconductor. Now, if the superconductor levitates above the film, there's a force on it. Let's continue looking at the drawing on the left of the screen. The force on the magnet has to come from someplace, and it comes from the image magnet. The image magnet induces its own magnetic field, which puts a force on the magnet in the positive z direction. Their south poles are facing each other, so they get pushed away from each other. The calculation can come from the simple idea that force is minus the gradient of potential energy. When you put a dipole moment in a magnetic field, that dot product of the magnetic dipole moment with the ambient magnetic field is minus the potential energy. This gives us a way to find the force on the magnet. All we have to do is find the magnetic field due to the image magnet at the location of the real magnet. The magnet's a dipole, therefore the image magnet is a dipole. And there's an expression for the magnetic field of a magnetic dipole, which is introduced in any intermediate electromagnetics textbook. I reference Wrights, Milford, and Christie here. We'll use this expression for the magnetic field due to the image magnet anywhere in space. In this case, anywhere in space is along the z-axis. And the location of the real magnet is a distance 2z away from the location of the image magnet. Take this expression for the magnetic field due to the image magnet, insert it into the expression for the force above right here. 
and then take the dot product with the magnetic dipole moment, which is also in the same direction as the magnetic field B, and then take the gradient. And this finally results in an expression for the force on the magnet using things that we have right in front of us, an expression for B, the magnetic field, and M, the magnetic dipole moment of the magnet, which is just a number Z hat. If the magnet levitates, it doesn't accelerate upward or downward. That means forces are balanced and the magnetic repulsion of the image magnet cannot be the only force on the magnet. There must also be another one. Of course, that's gravitational force on the magnet. So a free body diagram, an application of Newton's second law to this simple situation can be used to actually find the magnetic dipole moment. Equate these two forces, the magnetic force and the gravitational force, mg, and solve that for the magnetic dipole moment. You might want to just stop right now and work through that fairly quickly, remembering that dipole moment is in the z direction, so that dot product is not a difficult thing to evaluate. And if we put in the mass of this magnet, which happened to have been about 200 milligrams, to the 2.5 millimeter levitation height and mu naught, I can compute a magnetic dipole moment of about 10 to the minus 3 amps square meter. The units of magnetic dipole moment are current times area. So just by levitating a magnet above a superconductor and measuring how high it is and getting its mass, we're able to determine its magnetic dipole moment. The dipole moment of this magnet was in fact my first question. The second question was how much current is induced in the superconductor and does it exceed the critical current density. And to do that, let's go back to this picture. Only now I'm going to go off axis and so I need to define one more variable and that's this angle theta, which is the angle of the R vector, where the magnet is relative to where I am on the surface of the superconductor. And I'm going to calculate J, the current density, as a function of X, where along the surface I am. And the reason I need to do that is because I'll find, as you might expect, that the current density is different at different values of X. And there is some value of X where that current density is a maximum, and I want to find it. And then I want to find out what the current density is there. And I want to see if it exceeds JC. And now there are two magnetic dipoles creating magnetic field at the surface of the superconductor. There's the real magnet and there's the image magnet. Take that expression for magnetic field of a dipole and apply it to the real magnet and apply it to the image magnet and add them together and have the total magnetic field at the surface of the superconductor due to both dipoles. The reason why I'm not explicitly performing every step of the calculation is because this is actually a fairly common homework problem found in intermediate electromagnetism textbooks and I don't want to be working problems from textbooks and putting the solutions on YouTube. But now you can evaluate this expression for the magnetic field anywhere on the surface of the superconductor. And given this expression, I want to make a little comment about the relationship between the magnetic field at the surface of a conductor and the current inside of it. Numerically, they're actually the same thing. Magnetic field at the surface of a conductor and the surface current density at the surface of a conductor are the same thing with different directions, but otherwise the same. And actually, B, the magnetic induction field, divided by mu naught, is the magnetic field. K is the surface current density. Surface current K is in units of amps per meter. Its physical meaning is it's the amount of current beneath your feet if you're standing on the superconductor. So if you were to look down, if you were to stand here and look straight down, at some square area under your feet and look at the current density J and integrate along the Z axis, you can find K, the surface current density, by integrating from zero to Z equals minus infinity of J dZ. So it's all of the current density contained in an infinitely deep box of unit area under your feet. Now I'm going to ask you to work your own trig magic and eliminate the thetas in exchange for x and z. And after doing that, you'll have an expression for k as a function of where you are on the surface, x, just how far away you are from the axis where the magnet is floating. 
I am going to employ an important approximation at this point about J, and that is that the superconductor is so thin, it's only 400 nanometers thick, and J is high enough that we're in what you'd call a critical state, and the current density throughout the superconductor can be taken to be a constant. It's the same everywhere and not dependent on Z. So instead of actually carrying out an integral of J over Z, I just have to say that K, the amps per meter in the superconductor as I look down, is the current density, J, the amps per square meter, times the thickness of the current where the thickness of the current is the 400 nanometer film thickness that we have. So use that idea that K is J times the thickness in order to have an expression for J. Take this expression for K and divide out the thickness of the film, and that's what we have. So now we can answer the question, at what value of X is J a maximum? You find that by differentiating J with X, we have the expression for J because you see it's all this stuff that's K, just dividing also out by the thickness of the film. Differentiate it and set it equal to zero and solve for the value of X, where that derivative is zero, and you find out that J is at an extrema when X equals one half. It's at a maximum actually when X equals one half. So that's where we will evaluate J. Plug x equals one half z into this expression and evaluate it, solve it for j. Remember that's just k divided by the film thickness and this is the expression when x equals one half z and we have now an expression for the maximum current that is found anywhere in the superconductor. Let's use some real numbers and find out what we get when z is two and a half millimeters and we have that magnetic dipole moment that we already found of 0 0.001 amp meter squared and the thickness is 400 nanometers, that's the film thickness. Plug those quantities into that expression and solve, you get j equals 2.2 .2 times 10 to the 10th amps per square meter. Now it's worth asking if that's a big number. A search of the literature finds that a 77 Kelvin measured critical currents for thin film thallium, barium, calcium, copper oxide are about 7 to 8 times 10 to the 10th amps per square meter. So we have a margin of safety of about a factor of 3.5 on the current. Actual induced current density is about 3.5 times lower than the known critical current density for epitaxial TBCCO at 77 Kelvin. And therefore, I no longer need to be surprised that a magnet floats above this thin film superconductor at 77 Kelvin. It's actually plausible and within the realms of reason. One closing question for you concerns an experiment that I'm sure you've tried. Have you ever attempted to float a magnet above another magnet? You place the north pole of one magnet close to the north pole of another magnet and you hope to see that top magnet hover above the lower magnet but it never works it always flips over right away and then they stick together it's an unstable equilibrium and it won't last long enough to actually see the question i have is why isn't this case with the magnet above a superconductor unstable why doesn't that magnet flip over and then stick to the superconductor well, if you place the magnet above the superconductor, there's these currents that are induced in a certain direction in order to create the image magnet with opposite polarity. If you flip that magnet over, the screening currents would change their sense and the direction of the induced dipole moment in the image magnet would change its sense. At all points, the real magnet is above an image magnet that is oppositely directed. If you flip it over, it's still oppositely directed. So that floating magnet has no motivation to flip over again. And so I'll stop with that. Again, I'm Steve Ramillard. I did the demonstration in my microwave lab at Hope College. And thanks for watching.